Chapter 1. He saw Vilma first. She was the blonde one. Then he saw Gilda. She was the golden one. Naturally strawberry dark, but gilded. He didn't see the man at all, that first night. He didn't know any of their names. He didn't want to. He'd just gone to a show on his night off. He had an all seat, alongside the runway. He'd told the ticket seller he wanted to see more than just their baby blue eyes the ticket seller had said. You will. He'd been right, it turned out. At the moment Gumbo took his seat, there wasn't anything going on that a 14-year-old schoolgirl couldn't have watched with perfect propriety. A yellow-haired singer in a flowing, full-length dress was rendering a sentimental tune. And she was good, too. Gumbo noticed several onlookers, who certainly hadn't come in to be reminded of mother, furtively sticking thumbs into the corners of their eyes. But this was his night off and he felt kind of cheated. Did I walk in on a funeral? He asked himself. He shouldn't have asked that, maybe. The mocking little gods of circumstances were only too willing to arrange it for him. The singer walked off, the orchestra gave out with an introductory flourish, and the proceeding snapped back into character. The curtains parted to reveal a living statue group, five or six statuesque corns presided over by a central statue poised on a pedestal in their midst. This was Gilda, the main attraction. Gilda stood up there, head thrown back, seemingly in the act of nibbling at a dangling cluster of grapes. Whether she was as innocent of vesture as she seemed was beside the point, her body was coated with a thick layer of scintillating golden paint which was certainly far more protective than any ordinary pair of tights would have been. But that didn't dampen the general enthusiasm any. She got a tremendous hand without doing a thing, just for art's sake. The curtains coyly came together again, veiling the tableau. There was a teasing pause, maintained just long enough to whet the audience's appetite for more, then they parted once more and the statuary had assumed a different position. Gilda was now shading her eyes with one hand, one leg poised behind her, and staring yearningly toward the horizon, or, more strictly speaking, a fire door at the side of the auditorium. Gumbo caught the spirit of the thing along with everyone else and whacked his hands. The curtains met, parted once more, and again the tableau had altered. This time Gilda was up on tiptoes on her pedestal, her body arched over as though she was looking at her own reflection in a pool. Again she held the graceful pose. Just before the curtains obliterated her, Gumbo thought he saw her waver a little, as if having difficulty maintaining her balance. Or maybe it was simply faulty timing. She had prepared to change positions a little too soon, before the curtains entirely concealed her from view. That slight flaw didn't discourage the applause any. It had reached the pitch of a bombardment. The audience wasn't a critical one, it didn't care about complete muscular control as long as it got illusions through gold plating. The pause was a little longer this time, as though there had been a slight hitch. Gumbo wondered where the dancing came in. They had billed her out front as. The golden dancer, he remembered, and he wanted his money's worth. He didn't have long to wait. The footlights along the runway, unused until now, gushed up, the curtains parted, and Gilda was down on the stage floor now, and in motion. The audience forgot it had homes and families. She was coming out on the runway to dance over their heads, wearing a mantle of gauzy black. She wasn't any great shakes of a dancer, nobody expected her to be, nobody cared. It was mostly a matter of waving her arms, turning this way and that, and flourishing the mantle around her, a little bit like a bullfighter does his cape, managing to keep it all around her at all times, in a sort of black haze, like smoke. But indifferent as her dancing ability was to begin with, a noticeable hesitation began to creep into its posturing after she had been on the runway a moment or two. She seemed to keep forgetting what to do next. They hardly have time to rehearse at all, Gumbo thought leniently. Her motions had slowed down like a clock that needs winding. He saw her cast a look over her shoulders at the unoccupied main stage she had just come from, as if in search of help. The lesser Corins hadn't come out with her this last time, were probably doing a quick change for the next number. For a moment she stood up there perfectly still, no longer moving a muscle. The swirling black gauze deflated about her, fell limp. Gumbo's grin of approval dimmed and died while he craned his neck up at her. Suddenly she started to go off balance. He had only had time to throw up his arms instinctively, half to ward her off, half to catch her and break her fall. Her looming body blurred the runway lights for an instant, and then she had landed across him, one foot still up there on the runway behind her. The black stuff of her mantle came down after her, like a parachute, and half smothered him. He had to claw at it to free his head, get rid of it. Those in the rows further back, who hadn't been close enough to notice the break in her performance that had come just before the fall, started to applaud and even laugh, 
like fools. They seemed to think it was still part of her routine, or else that she had actually missed her footing and tumbled down on him, and either way it struck them as the funniest thing they had ever seen. Benton already knew better, by the inert way her head and shoulders lay across his knees. Take it easy. I've got you, he whispered reassuringly, trying to hold her as she started to slide to the floor between the rows of seats. Her eyes rolled unseeingly up at him, showing all whites, but some memory of where she was and what she had been doing still lingered in the darkness rolling over her. I'm so sorry. Did I hurt you, mister? She breathed. The performer's courtesy to the spectator, so seldom returned one. Guess I've spoiled the show, it ended with a long-drawn sigh, and she was still. The laughter and hand-clapping was dying down, because her head didn't bob up again at the place where she had disappeared from view, and they were catching on that something was wrong. A hairy armed man in rolled blue shirt sleeves popped partly out of the wings, not caring if he was seen or not, and wigwagged frantically to the band leader, then jumped back again where he'd come from. The droopy music they'd been playing for her broke off short and a rackety rumba took its place. A long line of chorus girls came spilling out on the stage, most of them out of step and desperately working to get their shoulder straps adjusted. Gumbo was already struggling up the aisle with his inert golden burden by that time. A couple of ushers came hustling down to help him, but he elbowed them aside. You quiet the house down. I can get her back there by myself. A man with a cigar sticking flat out of his mouth like a tusk, met him at the back, threw open a door marked manager. Bring her in here to my office, until I can send out for a doctor. Before closing it after the three of them, he stopped to scan the subsiding ripples of excitement in the audience. How they taking it? All right, keep them down in their seats, usher. No refunds, understand? He closed the door and came in. Gumbo had to put her in the manager's swivel chair, there wasn't even a couch or sofa in the place. Even with the shaded desk light on, the place stayed dim and shadowy. Her body gleamed weirdly in the gloom, like a shiny golden girl. Thanks a lot, bud, the manager said to him crisply. You don't have to wait, the doctor'll be here in a minute, mister. The tin says stick around. Gumbo reburied the badge in his pocket. The manager widened his eyes. That's a hot one. You're probably the only headquarters man out there tonight, and she keels over into your lap. That's the kind of luck I always have, Gumbo let him know, bending over the girl. I can't even see a show once a year, without my job horning in. The manager took another squint outside the door to see how his house was getting along. Forgotten all about it already, he reported contentedly. He turned back. How's she coming? She's dead, Gumbo said. The manager gave a sharp intake of breath, but his reaction was a purely professional one. Crap. Who'll I get to fill in for her on such short notice? What the hell happened to her? She was all right at the matinee. What did you expect her to do, Gumbo said, short-tempered. Come and inform you she was going to die in the middle of her act tonight, so you'd have time to get a substitute? He lifted one of the golden eyelids to try for optical reflex, there wasn't any. The hastily summoned doctor had paused outside the door, trying to take in as much of the show free as he could before he had to attend to business. He came in still looking fascinatedly behind him. You're too late, the manager scowled. This headquarters man says she's dead already. Gumbo was on the desk phone by now with his back to the two of them. A big belly laugh rolled in from outside before they could get the door closed, and drowned out what he was saying. He covered the mouthpiece until he could go ahead. Okay. He hung up. The examiner's office is sending a man over. We'll hear what he says in a couple of minutes. The doctor smiled. Well, he can't say any more than I can. She's dead and that's that. He can say why, Gumbo countered, dipping four fingers of each hand into his coat pockets and wiggling his thumbs. The private doctor closed the door after him. Now he's going to stand and chisel the rest of the show free, just because he was called in, the manager predicted sourly. He can have my seat, Gumbo remarked. I won't be using it anymore tonight. He brushed a fleck of gold paint off the front of his coat, then another off the cuff of his coat sleeve. Let's get the arithmetic down. He took out a black notebook, poised a worn down pencil stub over the topmost ruled line of a blank page. Those that had gone before, and many had gone before, were all closely scrawled over with names, addresses and other data. Then, one by one, wavy downward lines were scored through them. That meant, case closed. He hadn't bothered to tear them out and throw them away. When the entire booklet itself was used up, he would probably throw that away, intact. But what a light it could have thrown on the vicissitudes of human existence in a large city, 
what a tale of theft, violence, accident, misfortune, crime. The manager opened a drawer in his desk, took out a ledger, sought a pertinent page, traced a sausage-like thumb down a list of payroll names. Here she is. Real name, Annie Willis. Gilda was just her, Gumbo jotted. I know. He gave the address on West 135th. There's a phone number to go with it, too. Gumbo jotted. He looked up, said. Oh, hello, Jacobson, as the man from the examiner's office came in, went back to his note-taking again. Outside, three hundred odd people sat watching a lineup of girls dance. Inside, the business of documenting a human death went on, with low voice diligence. Gumbo repeated. Nearest of kin, Frank Willis, husband, the examining assistant groused softly to himself. I can't get anything out of it at all, especially through all this guilt. It might have been a heart attack, it might have been acute indigestion. All I can give you for sure, until we get downtown, is she's dead, good and dead. The manager was getting peevish at this protracted invasion of his privacy. That makes three times she's been dead, already. I'm willing to believe it, if no one else is, Gumbo murmured. This is the part I hate worst, and began to dial with his pencil stub. An usher sidled in, asked. What'll we do about the marquee, boss? She's still up on it, and it's gotta be changed now for tomorrow's matinee. Just take down the G from Gilda, see? Then stick in an H instead, make it Hilda. That saves the trouble of changing the whole. But who's Hilda, boss? I don't know myself one of the customers don't see anyone called Hilda, that'll teach them not to believe in signs. Gumbo was saying quietly. Is this Frank Willis? Are you the husband of Annie Willis, working at the new Rotterdam Theatre? All right, now take it easy. She died during the performance this evening. Yeah, on stage about half an hour ago. No, you won't find her here by the time you get down. You'll be notified when the body's released by the medical examiner's office. They want to perform an autopsy. Now don't get frightened, that's just a matter of form, they always do that. It just means an examination. You can claim her at the city morgue when they're through with her. He hung up, murmured under his breath. Funny how a strange word they don't understand, like autopsy, always throws a scare into them when they first hear it. He eyed the manager's swivel chair. It was empty now, except for a swath of gold paint flecks down the middle of the back, like a sunset reflection. Gumbo grimaced discontentedly. I should have stayed home tonight altogether. Then somebody else would have had to handle the blame thing. Never saw it to fail yet. Every time I try to see a show. Chapter 2 The next day at 11 a cop handed Gumbo a typewritten autopsy report. Gumbo didn't place the name for a minute. Then. Oh yeah, that girl in the show last night, Gilda. He glanced down at his own form with rueful recollection. It's going to cost me two bucks to have the front of that other suit dry cleaned. Okay, thanks. I'll take it into the lieutenant. He scanned it hastily himself first, before doing so. Then he stopped short, frowned, went back and read one or two of the passages more carefully. Death caused by sealing of the pores over nearly the entire body surface for a protracted period. This substance is deleterious when kept on for longer than an hour or two at the most. It is composed of infinitesimal particles of gold leaf which adhere to the pores, blocking them. This produces a form of bodily suffocation, as fatal in the end, if less immediate, than stoppage of the breathing passage would be. The symptoms are delayed, then strike with cumulative suddenness, resulting in weakness, dizziness, collapse and finally death. Otherwise the subject wars perfectly sound organically in every way. There can be no doubt that this application of theatrical pigment and failure to remove it in time was the sole cause of mortality. He tapped a couple of nails on the desk undecidedly a minute or two. Finally he picked up the phone and got the manager of the new Rotterdam Theatre. He hadn't come in yet, but they switched the call to his home. This is Gumbo, headquarters man that was in your office last night. How long had this Gilda, Annie Willis, you know, been doing this guilt act? Oh, quite some time, five or six months now. Then she wasn't green at it, she wasn't just breaking it in. No, no, she was on old hand at it. He hung up, tapped his nail some more. Funny she didn't know enough by this time to take it off before it had a chance to catch up with her, he murmured half under his breath. The report should have gone to his lieutenant, and that should have ended it. Accidental death due to carelessness, that was all. She'd been too lazy or too rushed to remove the harmful substance between shows, and had paid the penalty. 
but a good detective is five-sixths hard work and one-sixth blind, spontaneous hunches. Gumbo wasn't a bad detective. And his one-sixth had come uppermost just then. He folded the examiner's report, put it in his pocket, and didn't take it into his lieutenant. He went back to the new Rotterdam Theater, instead. It was open even this early, although the stage show didn't go on yet. A handful of sidewalk beachcombers were drifting in, to get in out of the sun. The manager had evidently thought better of his marquee shortchange of the night before. The canopy still misleadingly proclaimed. Hilda, the golden dancer but below it there was now affixed a small placard, so tiny it was invisible unless you got up on a ladder to scan it. Next week. The manager acted anything but glad one to see him back so soon. I knew that wasn't the end of it. With you fellows, these things go on forever. Listen, she keeled over in front of everybody in the theater. People are dropping dead on the streets like that every minute of the day, here, there, everywhere. What's there to find out about? Something gave out inside. It was her time to go, and there you are. Gumbo wasn't an argumentative sort of person. Sure, he agreed, unruffled. And now it's my time to come nosing around about it, and there you are. Who shared her dressing room with her, or did she have one to herself? The manager shrugged disdainfully. These aren't big stars playing this house. She split it with Vilma Lyons. That's the show's ballad singer, you know, the only full-dressed girl in the company, and June McKee, who leads the chorus in a couple of numbers. Are her belongings still in it? They must be. Nobody's called for them yet, as far as I know. Let's go back there, Gumbo suggested. Listen, the show's cooking to go on. I won't get in its way, Gumbo assured him. They came out of the office, went down a side all skirting the orchestra, with scattered spectators already lounging here and there. A 15-year-old motion picture, with Morse code dots and dashes running up it all the time, was clouding the screen at the moment. Climbing onto the stage at the side, they went in behind the screen, through the wings, and down a short, damp, feebly lighted passage, humming with feminine voices coming from behind doors that kept 63 opening and closing as girls came in from the alley at the other end of the passage, in twos and threes. The manager thumbed one of the doors, turned the knob and opened it with one and the same gesture, and a perfect indifference to the consequences. Kids, there's a detective coming in. The manager stood aside to let Gumbo pass, went back along the passageway toward his office with a warning. Don't gum them up now. This show hits fast once it gets going. There were two girls in there, working away at opposite ends of a three-paneled mirror. The middle space and chair were vacant. Gumbo's map appeared in all three of the mirrors at once, as he, came in and closed the door after him. One girl clutched at a wrapper, flung it around her shoulders. The other calmly went ahead applying makeup. You two have been sharing the same dressing room with Annie Willis, he said. Did she usually leave on this shiny junk between shows, or take it off each time? The chorus leader, the one the manager had called June McKee, answered, in high-pitched derogation at such denseness. What do you think, she could go out and eat between shows with her face all gold like that? she woulda had a crowd following her along the street. Sure she took it off. Suddenly they looked at one another with a flash of enlightened curiosity. The McKee girl, a dark-haired honey, turned around toward him on the makeup bench. Say, is that what killed her, that gold stuff? She asked in an awe-stricken, husky whisper. Gumbo overrode that. Did she take it off yesterday or did she leave it on? She left it on. She turned to her benchmate, the platinum blonde singer, for corroboration. Didn't she, Vilma? Remember? I do, it was only yesterday. Where is this gold stuff? I'd like to see it. It must be here with the rest of her stuff. The McKee girl reached over, pulled out the middle of the three table drawers, left it open for him to help himself. Look in there. It was in pulverized form, in a long jar. It had a greenish tinge to it that way. He read the label. It was put up by a reputable cosmetic manufacturing company. There were directions for application and removal, and then an explicit warning. Do not allow to remain on any longer than necessary after each performance. She must have read that a dozen times in the course of using the substance. She couldn't have failed to see it. You say she left it on yesterday. Why? Have you any idea? Again it was the McKee girl who answered, spading her palms at him. Because she mislaid the cleanser, the stuff that came with it to remove it. They both come together. You can't buy one without the other. It's a special preparation that sort of curls it up and peels it off clean and even. Nothing else works as well or as quick. 
you can't use cold cream, and even alcohol isn't much good. You can scrub your head off and it just makes a mess of your skin, gets it all red and fiery. And yesterday it disappeared? Right after the finale, she started to holler, who took my paint remover? Anybody seen the paint remover? Well, between the three of us, we turned the room inside out, and no sign of it. She emptied her whole drawer out. Everything else was there but that. She even went into a couple of the other dressing rooms to find out if anybody had it in there. I told her nobody else would want it. She was the only one in the company who used that gilt junk. 64 it wouldn't have been any good to anyone else. It never turned up. Finish telling me. Finally Vilma and me had to go out and eat. Time was getting short. Other nights, the three of us always ate together. We told her if she found it in time to hurry up after us. We'd keep a place for her at our table. She never showed up. When we got back for the night show, sure enough, she was still in her electroplating. She told us she'd had to send Jimmy, that's the handyman, out for something and had eaten right in the dressing room. Gumbo cocked his head slightly, as when one looks downward into a narrow space. Are you sure this bottle of remover couldn't have been in the drawer and she missed seeing it? That was the first place we cased. We had everything out, even two cockroaches that lived in a crack on the side. I remember holding it up in my hand empty and thumping the bottom of it just for luck. His wrist shot out of his cuff, hitched back into it again, like some sort of a hydraulic brake. Then what's it doing in there now? He was holding a smaller bottle, with liquid contents and a small sponge attached to its neck. It got quiet in the dressing room, deathly quiet. So quiet you could even hear the soundtrack from the screen out front. They both had such frightened looks on their faces, the superstitious fright of two giddy, thoughtless creatures who have suddenly come face to face with nameless evil. The McKee girl's lower lip was trembling with awe. It was put back after somebody wanted her to die like that. With us right here in the same room with her. She took a deep breath, threw open her own drawer, and with a defiant look at Gumbo, as if to say, try and stop me, tilted a small, flat gin bottle to her mouth. The ballet singer, Vilma Lyons, suddenly dropped her head into her folded arms on the littered dressing table and began to sob. The stage manager bopped a fist on the door and called in. The customers are waiting. If that dick ain't through questioning you in there, tell him to follow you out on the runway one. Chapter 3 Yes sir, I'm Jimmy, the handy vertical bar man. He put down his bucket, followed Gumbo out into the alley, where they wouldn't be in the way of the girls hustling in and out on quick changes. Yes, sir, Miss Gilda Dunn sent me out last night between shows to try to get her another bottle of that there stuff, which took off the gold paint. Why didn't you get it? I couldn't when I went to the big Theatcal drugstore on 8th where she told me. It's the only place around here where you can get it. Even there they don't keep much on hand, never get much call for it. The drugstore man told me somebody else just beat me to it. He told me he just got through selling the last bottle he had in stock, before I got there. Keep on, Gumbo said curtly. That's about all. The drugstore man promised to order another bottle for her right away from his company's warehouse or the wholesaler what puts it up, see that it's in by the first thing in the morning. So I go back and tell her. Then she send me across the street to bring her in a sandwich. When I come back the second time, she already sitting there acting kind of low, holding her head. She said she was sorry she ordered that bite, after all. She didn't feel well. She said she hopes nothing happened to her from leaving this stuff on too long. Gumbo told him. You caught along and point out that druggist to me. Come in, Gumbo. Lieutenant, I've got a problem. I've got a report here from Jacobson that I haven't turned into you yet. I've been keeping it until I know what to do about it. What's the hitch? Lieutenant, is there such a thing as a negative murder? By that I mean, when not a finger is lifted against the victim, not a hair of her head is actually touched. But the murder is accomplished by withholding something, so that death is caused by its absence or lack. The lieutenant was quick on the trigger. Certainly. If a man locks another man up in a room, and withholds food from him until the guy is starved to death, you'd call that murder, wouldn't you? Even though the guy that caused his death never touched him with a ten-foot pole, never stepped in past the locked door at all. Gumbo plucked doubtfully at the cord of skin between his throat and chin. But what do you do when you have no proof of intention? I mean, when you've got evidence that the act of withholding or removal was committed, but no proof that the intention was murderous. And how you gonna get proof of intention, anyway? It's something inside the mind, isn't it? The lieutenant glowered, said. What do you do? I'll tell you what you do? You work on your bird until you get the intention out of his mind and down in typewriting. That's what you do. 
The man was alone when he started down the three flights of stairs in the shoddy walk-up apartment on West 135th. He was still alone when he got down to the bottom of them. And then, somehow, between the foot of the stairs and the street door, he wasn't alone anymore. Gumbo was walking along beside him, as soundlessly as though his own shadow had crept forward and overtaken the morning man along the poorly lit passage. He shied sideways and came to a dead stop against the wall, the apparition was so unexpected. He was gaping. Gumbo said quietly. Come on, what are you stopping for? You were leaving the house, weren't you, Willis? Well, you're still leaving the house, what's the difference? They walked on as far as the street entrance. Gumbo just kept on fingertip touching the other's elbow, in a sort of mockery of guidance. Willis said. What am I pinched for? Who said you were pinched? Do you know of anything you should be pinched for? No, I don't. Then you're not pinched. Simple enough, isn't it? Willis didn't say another word after that. Gumbo only said two things more himself, one to his charge, the other to a cab driver. He remarked. Come on, we'll ride it. I'm no piker. And when a cab had sidled up to his signal, he named a precinct police station. They rode the whole way in stony silence from then on. Willis staring straight ahead in morbid reverie, Gumbo with his eyes toward the cab window, but on the shadowy reflection of Willis' face given back by the glass, not on the quiet street outside. They got out. Gumbo took him in and left him waiting in a room at the back for a few minutes, while he went off to attend to something else. This wasn't accidental, it was the psychological build-up, or rather, breakdown, preceding the grill. It had been known to work wonders. It didn't this time. All right, you can take him out now, he said to the subordinate who had been helping. Willis went out on his own feet, waveringly, leaning lopsided against his escort, but on his own feet. A sense of innocence can sometimes lend one moral support. But so can a sense of having outwitted justice. The guy must be innocent, the other dick remarked when he had come back. He knows we can't get him. There's nothing further in his actions to be uncovered, don't you see? We've got everything there is to get on him, and it isn't enough. And we can't get at his intentions. They got to come out through his own mouth. All he has to do is hold out. It's easy to keep a single, simple idea like that in your mind, no matter what happens. What breaks down most of them is the uncertainty of something they did wrong, something they didn't cover up right, cropping up and tripping them, an exploded alibi, a surprise identification by a material witness. He had none of that uncertainty to buck. All he had to do was sit tight inside his own skin. The ensign said to his lieutenant the next day. I'm certain he killed her. What are the three things that count in every crime? Motive, opportunity and method. He rings the bell on each count. Motive? Well, the oldest one in the world between men and women. He was sick of her, he'd lost his head about someone else, and didn't know how else and to get rid of her. She was in the way in more than just the one sense. She was a deterrent, because of the other woman's sense of loyalty, as long as she remained alive. It wouldn't have done any good if he walked out on her or divorced her, the other woman wouldn't have had him at her friend's expense and he knew it. It happens that the other woman was a lifelong friend of the wife, the kind of friendship that is more often met with between men than women, a real thick and thin partnership. She even lived near them, up at the 135th Street place, for a while after they were first married. Then she got out, maybe because she realized three's a crowd and a setup like that was only asking for trouble. Have you found out who this other woman is? Certainly. Vilma Lyons, the ballad singer in the same show with the wife. I went up to the theater yesterday afternoon. I questioned the two girls who shared Annie Willis' dressing room with her. One of them talked a blue streak. The other one didn't open her mouth, I don't recall her making a single remark during the entire interview. She was too busy thinking hack. She knew, her intuition must have already told her who had done it. At the end, she suddenly buried her face in her arms and cried. I let her take her own time. I let her think it over. I knew she'd come to me of her own accord sooner or later. And she did, after curtain time last evening, down here at the station house. Weren't we going to get the person that had done that to her friend, she wanted to know? Wasn't he going to be punished for it? Was he going to get away with it scot-free? Did she accuse him? She had nothing to accuse him on. He hadn't said anything to her. He hadn't even shown her by the look on his face. And then little by little I caught on by reading between the lines of what she said, that he'd liked her a little too well. He shrugged. She can't help us, she admitted it herself. Because he started giving her these long, 
haunting looks when he thought she wasn't noticing, and falling into reveries, and acting discontented and restless, that isn't evidence he killed his wife. But she knows, in her own mind, just as I know in mine, who hid that remover from Annie Willis, and with what object, and why. She hates him like poison now. I could read it on her face. He's taken her friend from her. They'd chummed together since they were both in pigtails, at the same orphanage. All right. What about opportunity, your second factor? He rings the bell there, too. And again it doesn't do us any good. Sure, he admits he was sitting out front at the matinee day before yesterday. But so was he a dozen times before. Sure, he admits he went backstage to her dressing room, after she'd gone back to it alone and while the other two were still on stage. But so had he a dozen times before. He claims it was already missing then. She told him so, and asked him to go out and get her another bottle. But who's to prove that? She's not alive, and neither of the two other girls had come off the stage yet. Well, what happened to the second bottle that would have saved her life? He paid for it. The clerk wrapped it for him. He started out holding it in his hand the way one does any circular package. And at the drugstore entrance, he collided with someone coming in. It was jarred out of his grasp, and it shattered on the floor. And as if he could sense what the lieutenant was going to say, he hurriedly added, there were witnesses galore to the incident, the clerk himself, the soda jerk, the cashier. I questioned every one of them. Not one could say for sure that it wasn't a genuine accident. Not one could swear that he'd seen Willis actually relax his hand and let it fall, or deliberately get in this other party's way. Then why didn't he go back and tell her? Why did he leave her there like that with this stuff insidiously injuring her system, so that she had to send this Jimmy out to see if he could get hold of any for her? We can't get anything on him for that, either. He did the natural thing, he went scouting around for it in other places, the way a man would, who was ashamed to come back empty-handed and tell her he'd just smashed the one bottle they had left in stock, afraid she'd ball him out maybe. Through thin lips Gumbo added acidly. Everything he did was so natural. That's why we can't get him. The lieutenant said. There's an important little point lurking in that smashed bottle angle. Did he know it was the last bottle on hand before he dropped it, or did he only find out after he stepped back to the counter and tried to get another? Gumbo nodded. I bore down heavy on that with the drug clerk. Unless Willis was deaf, dumb and blind, he knew that that was the last bottle in the store before he started away from the counter with it. The clerk not only had a hard time finding it, but when he finally located it, he remarked that it was the last one they had. Then that accident was no accident. Can you prove it? Was all Gumbo said. The lieutenant answered that by discarding it. Go ahead, he said sourly. I checked with every one of the other places he told me he'd been to after leaving there, and he had asked for it in each one. They corroborated him on that. He wasn't in much danger of coming across it anywhere else and he knew it. The drug clerk had not only forewarned him that he didn't think he'd find it anywhere else, but his wife must have told him the same thing before she sent him out. Screwing his mouth up, Gumbo said. But it looked good for the record, and it kept him away from the theater, while 68 she was dying by inches from cellular asphyxiation, without knowing it. Didn't he go back at all? Did he stay out from then on? No one saw him come back, not a soul. I made sure of that before I put it up to him. Gumbo smiled bleakly. I know what you're thinking there, and I thought of that, too. If he didn't go back at all, then he wasn't responsible for making the remover disappear in the first place. Because it was back in the drawer before the next matinee, I found it there myself. Now get the point involved. Willis had a choice between the natural thing and the completely exonerating thing. But an exonerating thing that would have meant behaving a little oddly. The natural thing for a man sent out on an errand by his wife is to return eventually, even if it's an hour later, even if it's only to report that he was unsuccessful. The exonerating thing, in this case, was for him to stay out for good. All he had to do was claim he never went back, and he was absolutely in the clear, absolutely eliminated. Well? The lieutenant could hardly wait for the answer. He played it straight all the way through. He admitted, of his own accord and without having been seen by anybody, that he stopped back for a minute to tell her he hadn't been able to get it, after chasing all over the forties for the stuff. And that, of course, is when the mysteriously missing bottle got back into the drawer. The lieutenant was almost goggle-eyed. Well. She was still alive, the murder hadn't even been completed yet, and he was already removing the traces of it by replacing the bottle from where he'd taken it. The timing of her act guaranteed that she was already as good as dead, even with the bottle back within her reach. She couldn't take the guilt off now for another three hours. 
using it continuously had already lowered her resistance. That brief breathing spell she would have had between shows spelled the difference between life and death. In other words, Lieutenant, he left her alive, with fifty people around her who talked to her, rubbed shoulders with her in the wings, after he'd gone. And later she even danced on stage before a couple hundred more. But he'd already murdered her. But you say he didn't have to admit he stopped back at the theater, and yet he did. Sure, but to me that doesn't prove his innocence, that only proves his guilt and infernal cleverness. By avoiding the slightest lie, the slightest deviation in his account of his actual movements, he's much safer than by grasping at a chance of automatic, complete vindication. Somebody just might have seen him come back, he couldn't be sure. Gumbo paused, thinking it through again. He took a deep breath. There it all is. Lieutenant, motive, opportunity and method. And it don't do us much good, does it? There isn't any more evidence to be had. There never will be. There's nothing more to uncover, because it all is uncovered already. We couldn't get him on a disorderly conduct charge on all of it put together, much less for murder. What do I do with him now? The lieutenant took time answering, as though he hated to have to. Finally he did. We'll have to turn him loose, we can't hold him indefinitely. There just aren't any loopholes here. I hate to see him walk out of here free, Gumbo said. There's no use busting your brains about it. It's a freak that only happens maybe once in a thousand times, but it happened this time. Chapter 4 Later that same morning Gumbo walked out to the entrance of the precinct house with Willis, after the formalities of release had been gone through. Willis had a lot of court plaster here and there, but he was free again. That was what mattered. Court plaster wears off after a while, several thousand volts of electricity does not. Well, I guess you think you're pretty smart, Gumbo said taciturnly. Willis said. That's the word for people that have held out something, gotten away with it. I got a beating for something I didn't do. Unlucky is the word for me, not smart. Gumbo stopped short at the top of the entrance steps, marking the end of his authority. He smiled. Well, if we couldn't get anything out of you in there last night, I didn't expect to get anything out of you out here right now. His mouth thinned. Here's the street. Beat it. Willis went down the steps, walked on a short distance alone and unhindered. Then he decided to cross over to the opposite side of the street. When he had reached it, he stopped a minute and looked back. Gumbo was still standing there on the police station steps, looking after him. Their stares met. Gumbo couldn't read his look, whether it conveyed mockery or relief or just casual indifference. But for that matter, Willis couldn't read Gumbo's either, whether it conveyed regret or philosophic acceptance of defeat or held a vague promise that things between them weren't over yet. There was a brittle quality of long smoldering rancor about her, even when she first opened the door, even before she'd had time to see who was standing there. She must have just got home from the show. She still had her coat on. But she was already holding a little jigger glass of colorless liquid between two of her fingers, as if trying to cauterize inner resentment that was continually gnawing at her. Her eyes traveled over him from head to foot and back again. Been letting any more killers go since I saw you last? She said. You've taken that pretty much to heart, haven't you? Gumbo answered levelly. Why wouldn't I? Her ghost powders its nose on the bench next to me twice a day. A couple performances ago I caught myself turning around and saying, Did you get paid this week, and, before I stopped to think. She emptied the jigger. And do you know what keeps the soreness from healing? Because the person that did it is still around, untouched, unpunished. Because he got away with it. You know who I mean or do I have to break out with a name? You can't prove it, any more than we could, so why bring up a name? Gumbo asked her. Prove it. Prove it. You make me sick. She went back and refilled the jigger. Her face was livid. You're the police. Why weren't you able to get him? You talk like a fool, he said patiently. You talk like we let him go purposely. Do you think I enjoyed watching him walk out scot-free under my nose? And that isn't all. I've been passed over on the promotion list, on account of it. They didn't say it was that, they didn't say it was anything. They didn't have to. I can figure it out for myself. It's the first blank I've drawn in six years. It's eating at my insides, too, like yours, C.H.E. relented at the signs of nurse bitterness that matched her own. Misery likes company, I guess. Come on in, as long as you're here, detective by courtesy. Have a stab, she said grudgingly, and pushed the gin slightly toward him. They sat in brooding silence for several minutes, two frustrated people. Finally she spoke again, a cruller of white hate outlining her mouth. 
he had the nerve to put his flowers on her grave. Imagine, flowers from the killer to the one he killed. I found them there when I went up myself, before the matinee today, to leave some roses of my own. The caretaker told me whose they were. I tore them in a thousand pieces when he wasn't looking. I know, he said vindictively. He goes up twice a week, leaves fresh flowers each time. I've been casing him night and day. The hypocritical rat. All the way through from the beginning, he's done the natural thing. He does it whether he thinks anyone's watching or not, and that's the safe way to do it. He refilled his own jigger without asking her permission. He laughed harshly. But just the same, he's not pining away. I cased his flat while he was out of it today, and I found enough evidence to show there's some brunette has been hanging around to console him. Hairpins on the kitchen floor, a double set of dirty dishes in the sink. He's probably just waiting for the temperature to go down enough, before he marries up with her. She lit at her eyes, touched a hand to her own platinum blonde hair. I'm not surprised, she said huskily. That would be about his speed. She got up suddenly. These jiggers are too small. She came back with a tumbler, a third full. Maybe you can still get something on him through her, she suggested balefully. He shook his head. He can go around with ten brunettes if he feels like it. He's within his rights. We can't hold him just for that alone. What's the matter with the law these days? She said almost savagely. Here we are, you and I, sitting here in this room. We both know he killed Annie Willis. You're drawing pay from the police department, and he's moving around immune and fancy free only a few blocks away from us at this very minute. He nodded as though he agreed with her. They fail you every once in a while, he admitted gloomily. The statutes as they are written down on the books. They slip a cog and let someone fall through. Then he went on. But there's an older law than the statutes we work under. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. It's short and sweet, got no amendments, dodges or habeas corpuses to clutter it up. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. I like the way that sounds, she said. You're getting a little lit. I shouldn't be talking like this. I'm not getting lit. I understand every word you say. But more important still, I hear the words you're not saying. He just looked at her, and she looked at him. They were like two fencers, warily circling around each other to find an opening. She got up, moved over to the window, stared grimly out toward the traffic intersection at the corner ahead. Green light, she reported. Then she turned toward him with a bitter, puckered smile. Green light. That means go ahead, doesn't it? Green light, he murmured. That means go ahead, if you care to. The gin was making him talk a little more freely, although that was the only sign of it he showed. The man that throws the switch in the death house at Sing Sing, what makes him a legal executioner and not a murderer? The modern statutes. The ancient code can have its legal executioners, too, who are not just murderers. She had come over close to him again. But never, he went on, looking straight at her. Repay the gun with a knife, or the knife with a club. Then that's murder, not the ancient code anymore. In the same way, if the state executioner shot the condemned man on his way to the chair, or poisoned him in his cell, then he wouldn't be a legal executioner anymore, he'd be just a murderer himself. He repeated it again for her slowly. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Annie Willis met her death by having something withheld from her that her safety required. No weapon was used on Annie Willis, remember? Yes, she said with flaming dreaminess. And I know where there's a trunk that belongs to me, down in a basement storage room, seldom entered, seldom used. One of these big, thick theatrical trunks, roomy enough to carry around the props for a whole act. I left it behind when I moved out. I was going to send for it but. She didn't finish it. She looked down at his empty jigger, as if he was listening intently to her, but without looking at her. And if I came to you, for instance, and said, what's been bothering you and me both has been taken care of, how would you receive me, as a criminal under the modern law or a legal executioner under the old one? He looked straight up at her with piercing directness. The modern law failed you and me, didn't it? Then what right would I have to judge you by it? She murmured half audibly, as if endeavoring to try him out. Then why not you? Why me? The injury was done to you, not me. A friend is a personal belonging, a professional disappointment isn't. Nothing was done to me personally. Under the ancient law, a frustrated job can only be repaid by another frustrated job, by making the person who injured you suffer a like disappointment in his work, she laughed dangerously. I can do better than that, she said softly. 
she kept shaking her head, looking at him from time to time as if she still found the situation almost past belief. The strangest things never get down on the record books. They wouldn't be believed if they did. Here you are, sitting in my room, a man drawing pay from the police department, with a shield in your pocket at this very minute, she didn't finish it. I'm a little bit tight on your gin, he said, getting up. And we haven't been talking. She held the door open for him. No, she smiled. We haven't been talking. You weren't here tonight, and nothing was said. But perfect understanding doesn't need words. I'll probably see you again to let you know how, what we haven't been talking about is coming along. The door closed and Danny Gumbo went down the stairs with an impassive face. Chapter 5 The lady says. Die. TT that followed this event was backslash slash backslash slash even more incredible yet. A cop came into him, down at the precinct house three nights later, said. There's a lady out there asking for you, Gumbo. Won't state her business. Gumbo said. I think I know who you mean. Look, Corrigan, you know that little end room on the left, at the back of the hall? Is there anyone in there right now? The cop said. Nah, there's never anyone in there. Take her back there, will you? I'll be back there. He got there first. She stood outlined in the open doorway first, watching the cop return along the hall to where he'd come from, before she'd come in. Gumbo acted slightly frightened. He 72 kept pacing nervously back and forth, waiting for her to come in. When she finally turned away from seeing the cop off, she came in and closed the door after her. He said. Couldn't you have waited until I dropped over to see you? How did I know when you'd be around again? I felt like I couldn't wait another half hour to get it off my chest. There was something almost gloating in the way she looked around her. Is it safe to talk here? Sure, if you keep your voice down. He went over to the door, opened it, looked along the passageway outside, closed it again. It's all right, she said, half mockingly, with that intimacy of one conspirator for another. No dictaphones around? He was too on edge to share her bantering mood. Don't be stupid, he snapped. How did I know you were going to pull a raw stunt like this? This is the last place I ever expected you to, she lit a cigarette, preened herself. You think you're looking at a cheap ballad singer on a burlesque circuit, don't you? What am I looking at, then? You're looking at a legal executioner, under the ancient code. I have a case of justice to report. I had a friend I valued very highly, and she was caused to die by having the skin of her body deprived of air. Now the man who did that to her is going to die sometime during the night, if he hasn't already, by having the skin of his body, and his lungs and his heart, deprived of air in the same way. He lit a cigarette to match hers. His hands were so steady, too steady, rigid almost, that you could tell they weren't really. He was forcing them to be that way. His color was paler than it had been when he first came in. What have you got to say to that? She clasped her own sides in a parody of macabre delight, gloated with pleasure. It'll tell you in a minute. He went over to the door, opened it and looked out again, as if to make sure there was no one out there to overhear. He dropped his cigarette on the way over to it. She misunderstood. Don't be jittery, she began scornfully. He'd raised his voice suddenly, before she knew what to expect. It went booming down the desolate hallway. Corrigan. Come here a minute. A blue-suited figure had joined us in the opening before she knew what was happening. He pointed toward her. 66, risk this woman for murder. Hold her here in this room until I get back. I'm making you personally responsible for her. A bleed of smothered fury ripped from her. Why, you dirty, double-crossing, the guy isn't even dead yet. I'm not arresting you for the murder of Frank Willis. I'm arresting you for the murder of his wife, Annie Willis, over a month and a half ago at the new Rotterdam Theatre. The greater part of it came winging back from the far end of the hallway, along which he was moving fast on his way to try to save a man's life. They came trooping down single file, fast, into the gloom. White poker chips of light glanced off the damp, cemented brick walls from their torches. The janitor was in the lead. He poked at a switch by his sense of memory alone, and a feeble parody of electricity illuminated part of the ceiling and the floor immediately under it, nothing else. I ain't seen him since yesterday at noon, he told them in a frightened voice. I seen him going out then. That was the last I seen of him. Here it is over here, gents. This door. They fanned out around it in a half circle. All the separate poker chips of 73 torchlight came to a head, focused on one big door, which was fireproof, nail-studded iron, rusty but stout. 
but it was fastened simply by a padlock clasping two thick staples. I remember now, my wife said something about his asking her for the key to hear, earlier in the evening while I was out, the janitor said. So he was still all right then. Yes, he was still all right then, Gumbo agreed shortly. Get that thing. Hurry up. A crowbar was inserted behind the padlock chain, two of the men with him got on one end of it and started to pry. Something snapped. The unopened lock bounced up, and they swung the storage space door out with a grating sound. The torch beams converged inside and lit it up. It was small and cramped. The air was already musty and unfit to breathe even the unconfined air at large between its four sides, and it was lifeless. All the discarded paraphernalia of forgotten tenants over the years choked it. Cartons, empty packing cases, a dismantled iron bed frame, even a kid's sled with one runner missing. But there was a clear space left between the entrance and the one large trunk that loomed up in it, like a towering headstone on a tomb. It stood there silent, inscrutable. On the floor before it lay, in eloquent meaning, a single large lump of coal brought from the outside part of the basement and discarded after it had served its purpose. Two smaller fragments had chipped off it, lay close by. A blow on the head with that would daze anyone long enough too, Gumbo scuffed it out of the way with his foot. Hurry up, fellows. She'd only left here when she looked me up. It's not a full hour yet. The seams may be warped with age, there's still a slim chance, they pushed the scared, white-lipped janitor back out of their way. Axe blades began to slash around the rusted snaplock. Not too deep, Gumbo warned. Give it flat strokes from the side, or you're liable to cut in and, got that pull motor ready? The axes held off at his signal and he pulled the dangling lock off the splintered seams with his bare hands. They all jumped in, began pulling in opposite directions. The trunk split open vertically. A face stared sightlessly into the focused torch beams, a contorted mask of strangulation and unconsciousness that had been pressed despairingly up against the seam as close as it could go, to drink in the last precious molecule or two of air. Illis' body, looking shrunken, tumbled out into their arms. They carried him out into the more open part of the basement, one hand that ended in mangled nails trailing inertly after him. An oxygen tank was hooked up, and a silent, grim struggle for life began in the eerie light of the shadowy basement. Twice they wanted to quit, but Gumbo wouldn't let them. If he goes, that makes a murderer out of me. And I won't let myself be a murderer. We're going to bring him back, if we stay here until tomorrow night. And then, in the middle of the interminable silence, a simple, quiet announcement from the man in charge of the squad. He's back, Gumbo. He's going again. Somebody let out a long, whistling breath of relief. It was a detective who had just escaped being made into a murderer. At the hospital later, in the early hours of the morning, when he was able to talk again, Willis told him the little there was to tell. She showed up and said she wanted to get something out of that trunk she'd left behind here in our care, when she'd moved away. I got the key to the storage room from the janitor's wife. I should have tumbled she had something up her sleeve when she asked me not to mention who it was for, let them think I wanted it for myself. Then she got me to go down there with her by pretending there were some things of Annie's in the trunk, from their days in show business together, that she wanted to give back to me. I didn't open my mouth to her, didn't say a word. I was afraid to trust myself, afraid if I came out with what was on my mind, I'd beat her half senseless and only get in more trouble with you police guys. I couldn't wait to get rid of her, to see the last of her. I even helped her to open the trunk, because it was pretty heavy to handle. Then she asked me to bend down and see if I could reach something that was all the way down at the bottom of one of the two halves, and I stepped between them like a fool. Something that felt like a big rock hit the back of my head, and before my senses had a chance to clear, the two sides had swung closed on me like a, he shuddered. Like a coffin when you're still alive. He swung one finger bandaged paw in front of his eyes to shut out the recollection. The rest was pretty awful. The lieutenant came in, holding the confession in his hands. Gumbo followed. She put away? Yes, sir. The lieutenant went ahead, reading the confession. Gumbo waited in silence until he'd finished. The lieutenant looked up finally. This'll do. It's strong enough to hold her on, anyway. You got results, but I don't get the technique. What was this business of her coming here and confiding in you that she'd made an attempt on Willis' life tonight, and how does that tie in with the murder of Annie Willis? You hit the nail on the head. This confession proves that, but I don't follow your line of reasoning. I miss the connecting links. Gumbo said. Here was the original equation. A wife in the middle, a man and a woman on the ends. She was in the way, but of which one of them? 
Vilma Lyons claimed it was Willis who loved her. Willis didn't claim anything, the man as a rule won't. She watched them to see which would approach the other. Neither one did. The innocent party, because he had never cared in the first place, the guilty, because he or she had a guilty conscience, was not only afraid that he was being watched by us, but also that the other might catch on in some way, connect the wife's death with him or her, if he made a move too soon after. But still I couldn't tell which was which, although my money was still on Willis, up to the very end. Here was the technique. When I saw neither of them was going to tip a hand, I tipped it, instead. There's nothing like a shot of good, scalding jealousy in the arm for tipping the hand. I went to both of them alike, gave them the same build-up treatment. I was bitter and sore, because I'd muffed the job. In Willis' case, because we'd already held him for it once. I had to vary it a little, make him think I'd changed my mind, now thought it was Vilma, but couldn't get her for it. In other words, I gave them both the same unofficial all-clear to go ahead and exact retribution personally. And I lit the same spark to both their fuses. I told Willis that Vilma had taken up with some other guy, I told her he had taken up with some other girl. One fuse fizzled out. The other flared and exploded. One of them didn't give a damn, because he never had. The other, having already committed murder to gain, continued from page 74, the object of her affection, saw red, would have rather seen him dead than have somebody else get him. You see. Lieutenant, murder always comes easier the second time than the first. Given equal provocation, whichever one of those two had committed the murder the first time, I felt wouldn't hesitate to commit it a second time. The one that hadn't, probably couldn't be incited to contemplate it, no matter what the circumstances. Willis had loved his wife. He smoldered with hate when I told him we had evidence Vilma had killed her, but he didn't act on the hints I gave him. It never occurred to him too. Only one took advantage of the leeway I seemed to be giving them, and went ahead. That one was the real murderer. Having murdered once, she didn't stop at murder a second time. It's true, he conceded. That that's not evidence that would have done us very much good by itself, in trying to prove the other case. But what it finally did manage to do was make a dent in the murderer's armor. All we had to do was keep hacking away and she finally crumbled. Being caught in the act the second time weakened her self-confidence in her immunity for what she'd done the first time, gave us a psychological upper hand over her, and she finally gave up and told us all. He indicated the confession she had dictated and signed. Well, pondered the lieutenant, stroking his chin. It's not a technique that I'd care to have you men make a habit of using very frequently. In fact, it's a damn dangerous one to monkey around with, but it got results this time, and that's the proof of any pudding. The end.